Sean is really lucky that um, he's 120 years too late um, for an exciting adventure in central Victoria. In, in, in 1890, uh, the first free thinker was brought uh, to Mechanics Institute, not far from here, to speak to the populace, to address them about free thought. And when the speaker and his host got to the Mechanics Institute, they found a huge crowd of angry people protesting at his, uh, his existence, uh, his, his arrival in, in the area. And they were armed with pitchforks and shovels and they were getting very angry. And the free thinker actually had to flee uh, in fear of their lives out the back door and ran to the police station. And the police station locked their doors against them. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They said, it's nothing to do with us. They were probably all Irish Catholics anyway. So the upshot of it was that uh, they, they weren't uh, actually uh, beaten up or anything uh, because the, the free thinker, he must have been a, a free market free thinker, uh, produced some money and, and paid these protesters and said, look, if we give you all our money, will you go away and not beat us up? And they thought that was a fair deal, so they went away. <laughs> and he was able to escape from central Victoria. I hope we give... Uh, Sean, a much more enthusiastic and uh, um, appro uh, approving welcome than that. Uh, Sean Fairclough. That is the only introduction where people have talked about bringing out pitchforks uh, before introducing me, so thank you. That, I've never had one like that. Um, it is exciting and amazing to me that here we are in kind of regional Victoria and having such a, a nice crowd for an, an event with the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, but maybe I shouldn't be surprised since according to the Facebook page uh, Analytics, uh, Australia is the most Dawkinsian country in the world. That is with the most uh, Dawkins uh, uh, enthusiasts per capita of any country in the entire world, so you can stand proud. Uh, I, and by the way, I just made up the word Dickensian, so I feel <laughs> kind of proud of myself. It's not like Dickensian. It's very, very different from that. And you have, you know, some strong competition, because uh, I have had the honor of being the opening speaker for Richard Dawkins for three book tours, and there's a lot of enthusiasm all over the world for him in a lot of places that you might not expect. Not too long ago, I think on the second book tour with Richard Dawkins, we had uh, an event at a place called Eastern Kentucky University. And I have to tell you, I, I, before being there, I had never even heard of Eastern Kentucky University. But when I showed up, it sure had an impact because there were 2,300 people at Eastern Kentucky University to see Richard Dawkins. And for those of you who know uh, the United States, Kentucky is really part of the Bible Belt. 2,300 people, and it's even more uh, surprising than that because the big city in Kentucky is Louisville, and it's about two hours outside of Louisville. It's really in rural Bible Belt, Kentucky. And when I talked about a 10-point vision of a secular America with uh, values that are expressly secular, we had a roaring crowd at this event. And it's really thanks to Richard Dawkins. Uh, that we were able to have this opportunity because the crowd was really excited. They were excited to see Richard Dawkins, that's for sure. But I think they were even more excited to see each other because they, a lot of them felt like they were the only one, like this guy that uh, was described here in, in Victoria, that, you know, they thought they might show up and see people with pitchforks and they saw a bunch of people celebrating each other. And that's what you really get with Richard Dawkins. I mean, I thought, oh, okay, when I got this job, he's a scientist and you know, fine, that's very interesting. And he is, but I'm finding, particularly with young people actually, you know, that uh, for people born before uh, 1945, that there are only a handful that have appeal to people born after 1975. And in my mind, it's really, you know, Jagger, McCartney, uh, Dylan, and Dawkins. I mean, that's the kind of appeal uh, that we see. And you folks, can I guess, uh, different than when there were pitchforks here in the state of Victoria, you can feel kind of 
uh, relaxed and proud of yourselves, right? Because there's such a high percentage of secular people in the nation of Australia and sort of look back and say, well, look at all those crazy people in the other countries. That would be quite tempting uh, to do that. But I'm going to ask a little something more of you because we in America kind of look up to you. We look up to Australians because to us, Australia, you know, especially with all the political problems we've had in the United States, we kind of look like you're, you're like us, but it's more fun and less Tea Party crazy people here. So we kind of look admiringly to you, and I know the young people in America kind of look admiringly to Tim Minchin as the example of what an Australian is, and they like that example, you know. Uh, but that's because Americans don't know much about Tony Abbott, so we don't know. <laughs> you know, about other issues that you face. But one person who does know about uh, Tony Abbott is your former Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, who I had the honor to meet just a couple of days ago, yesterday. And Malcolm Fraser, in addition to being one of the great international leaders for human rights, and you may be disgruntled with your politics these days, but he was and is a real leader for human rights around the world. And one of the things that Malcolm Fraser said just recently was that he was concerned because he didn't think Tony Abbott really understood that this nation, Australia, was founded on the values of separation of church and state, which I thought was something to be really proud of, not only that you have that tradition, but be proud of that you have a former prime minister who's willing to articulate uh, that kind of principle. And it's, you know, both parties, because I also, I have to say, since I was a kid, I've been impressed with Bob Hawke when I learned that he set the world record for downing a pint. I said, now that's a leader of a country that impresses me and he's expressly non-religious. So really, you folks have a lot that we can look up to in this country, and I can understand why you might be kind of satisfied and say, well, we don't need to worry about the problems that they have in America and some of these other countries. But I want to offer a bit of a cautionary tale for my country in America. Because if you were a citizen of the United States, back in, say, 1970, and somebody said to you, hey, where do you think about the fundamentalists? What's their political influence in the United States? You'd rightly say, they're nobody. They're zero in the United States. Barry Goldwater, the leader of right-wing republicanism in the United States of that era, they called him Mr. Conservative, Mr. Republican. Barry Goldwater said, and I'm quoting, I have no respect for the religious right. Barry Goldwater would have had zero chance in the Republican primary of 2012. That's how much things have changed. And, you know, in some ways you can kind of understand where America was back then. We just had three of our greatest leaders had been shot down, and the country was kind of downcast and downhearted at that time. And then simultaneous with that, we saw the coming together of a holy trinity, or maybe some might call it an unholy tri trinity, of the right-wing Catholicism, sort of the rejecting of the old Kennedy working class Catholicism, uh, not that the Kennedys were working class, but the people who supported them were, and that that sort of fell by the wayside for a new kind of Scalia Catholicism in the United States that combined with fundamentalist Protestantism that never happened before in the United States, and then combined with Mormonism. And they became a really powerful trinity in American political life. And this sort of hard right religious viewpoint really started to gain traction and gain power in the 70s and the 80s uh, in the United States of America. And well, how did they do it? Well, I think the first places that they looked were local. They looked to the schools. They looked to the school boards. They looked to the parent-teacher associations and the local state governments, got on the town councils and worked their way up until by the time, a couple decades later, you had George W. Bush telling the president of France that part of his reasoning for invading Iraq had to do with the Book of Revelations. Pretty successful for the religious right. I mean, to have one of two major political parties in the United States where the religious right had veto power effectively over those, uh, one of those two political parties. Nobody would have anticipated that 
in the United States back in 1970. So it was a dramatic change. And the religious right doesn't make any bones about it. They are ambitious. They were ambitious and have been successful in kind of fighting above their weight class in the United States. I say, you know, despite the name that they used to have, they're neither moral nor the majority. But they, nonetheless, because of their power over the Republican Party, seem to demonstrate kind of equipoise in power in America, even though that's not really true. That's far above their actual numbers in the United States. And they continue to have ambition where they are out there saying they want to be an export business for fundamentalism. They really want to take their fundamentalist viewpoint and export it throughout the world. And they've been doing that successfully. You look at Uganda. Uganda, where you know that law where they said death penalty for gay people, where there are religious right organizations in the United States that provided money and organization to export their views and their moral values to places like Uganda and Nigeria, but not simply the developing world, but also to developed world countries like Australia. There's a book called Pastorpreneur. That's the name of the book, and you can kind of guess from the title what it's about, that they want to take this sort of business growth uh, approach to big box churches. In 1970, there were fewer than 100 what we call mega churches. That's 2,000 on an average Sunday less than 100 in the entire United States. Now there are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of megachurches, often with multiple pastors in each megachurch, raking in the bucks off times with their big houses and their fancy cars, and in some cases, private jets. That's what we've seen as a change, and they want to export that to places like Australia. And I think we need to consider here in Australia what that might mean in the context of what's been happening in this country in the last couple of decades. A couple of examples. There's the Bible Baptist Christian Academy here in Australia. They receive 86% of their money from you, from the taxpayers. Now, they're supposedly a private school, but because of that court decision, they get direct government funding. That's 86%. That's more than some of the so-called government schools get from uh, the Australian government. And here's some of the things they teach at that school. They quote, reality of eternity in hell, that that reality exists for children. With your tax money, they're teaching that. They teach something called the Accelerated Christian Education Curriculum. And trust me, Google it, read about it. It's produced in the United States. The fundamentalist schools in the United States use that curriculum, and it is scary right-wing theology taught to children, apparently at this school, in Australia. And they teach that the world was created in six 24-hour days with your tax money. Think about that, what, what that means for the next generation of children. Rehoboth College in Australia seeks to teach Darwin. Why? So that they can refute it, and they say so. They attack, quote, and I'm quoting, scientifically ridiculous theories of ice ages and glacial epochs. Parks Christian School trains children to, quote, be soldiers of the king, quote, to do quote, battle for their Lord in a world that rejects his laws and dominion. That school, 78% of their money comes from you, comes from your tax dollars. Some of you might be familiar with Pastor Phil Pringle. He's someone who believes, says expressly, he believes in dominionism, which is something else you ought to look up. He believes in dominionist values and says that the world is too much controlled by Satan and specifically advocates that religion, his type of religion, should gain dominance in other sectors of life, the media and the government. He wants that viewpoint to gain dominance in the government. Think about what it means for someone who is a rather popular minister in this country to be preaching those kind of values. And by the way, his organization runs a school. Almost 40% of Australian secondary school students attend non-government schools. 90% of that group are Christian schools. And since 1996, it's fundamentalist schools that have been continuing to increase in this country. So that's something that you face in this society that, by the way, despite all the problems in the United States that I list in my book, 
We don't give direct government money to fundamentalist schools like is happening in this country. And then in your government funded schools, special religious education. Many of you are familiar with this issue, but think about how that works from the point of view of the child. Okay, here's all the Christian kids going to the special religious education. Oh, sorry, uh, non-religious kid, you sit over there. Oh, Muslim kid, you sit over there. Hindu kid, you sit over there. Education is supposed to unite people, not divide people. But that's what we're seeing happening in this country, and it's deeply unfortunate. Chaplains, we talk about chaplains in schools. Well, the uh, psychological professionals in this country came forward with a statement saying they're very concerned because these people don't have the training to address issues of teen suicide, domestic abuse in the home. They're not trained for those issues. In fact, it seems like the only unique characteristic, unique qualification that these chaplains have is that there is no qualification. They simply get a stamp of approval from an organization that basically has fundamentalist connections. Is that something that we want to see in schools? And again, it has the potential to create division in society rather than unity. So I suggest that there should be some vigilance about what's happening in this country Although I'll hear people say, while I've been traveling around from Sydney and here to uh, Victoria, I hear people say, yeah, you know, but in America, we're so secular here in Australia. That's ne you don't need to worry. That's never going to happen here. And I understand that reasoning. I can understand how people would think that. But then I'll talk to people. I'd say, geez, you know, in America, we've got a couple states where uh, there's freedom of choice and death with dignity regarding your end-of-life choices. What's happening with that? And Australians will say to me, well, no, uh, we can't do that, or that can't happen because the political parties, the major political parties in Australia are aligned with various religious groups, so you're not going to see uh, freedom of choice regarding death with dignity in this country anytime soon because of those religious political pressures here in Australia. And I'll say, geez, you know, in the United States, Forget what the Supreme Court may or may not do in the United States. We've already got several states that have approved marriage equality for gay people in the United States of America. What's happening with that Are in, in Australia? And they say, well, you know, because of the alignments of the political parties in this country, that's not happening here right now either. So I just want people to take a step back and think, what happens? What happens in a society, and what would an American have said in 1970 when they say, oh, there won't be any chance for the religious right to have major influence in a society? Well, Americans would have said, no, it won't happen. And I would call upon all of us, whatever country that we're from, to be vigilant and to maybe be on the vanguard, because it is true that Australians are more secular as a whole than most other nations. But what I'd hope that would mean is not to sit back, but to instead say, let's take some leadership. Because you can have an opportunity. That, you know, now with the internet, there's a way that we can provide international leadership, and a lot of these national borders don't matter as much as they used to. And it would be a great service. For instance, just to your neighbors up in New Guinea, where just the other day they killed someone for being a witch. You know, it's that humanitarian uh, call to our fellow citizens all throughout the world that I think people in Australia could help lead. And not just to your immediately neighboring nations, but all around the world. I get at the Dawkins Facebook page direct messages from people. I got one from Pakistan the other day from a guy who said, you know, I spoke my conscience. I put together a free thinking page in Pakistan a Pakistani Facebook page. And you know what happened? We got thousands of people who liked our page in Pakistan. You know what else I got? A message from somebody who told me that I was someone who was an infidel and I should have my head chopped off. And they weren't joking with this guy. And I think we should care beyond our own national borders about a brave young man like that who's willing to take a stand for his principles and for his values. And that's what the Richard Dawkins Foundation can work in partnership with you to do. Because I'll tell you, my book, my book isn't a whether or not book regarding religion. You know, there's this obscure writer you may have heard of, Richard Dawkins. He wrote a really good book on that topic, and I encourage you to buy that book. But my book is about how to. It's about what are we going to do next. 
You know, and when we talked about earlier about having a 10-point plan for reclaiming a secular Australia, I'm very honored by this and from modeling from my book, but more than that, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with you and with the Rationalist Society of Australia for saying we're going to do something that brings the country forward and really works for change because I think you folks can be leaders of an international secular movement where you're vigilant about what happens in your own country, but you can advocate for human rights internationally, like Malcolm Frazier has done for many years. We could do that together with the Richard Dawkins Foundation in partnership as a people. And that's what I want to see us do, is organize campaigns, focus media attention on what is happening. And I guarantee you that this is something I'm committing the rest of my life to. This is what I care about. And I feel so passionately about this because of some of the experiences I've had. When I was in the legislature, 10 years in the legislature, you know who I never heard from? Not once, not ever. No one ever came to me and lobbied to say, I'm a secular person, I'm a humanist, I'm an atheist, I'd like you to vote this way. Not once, not one time. But day in and day out, when I was sitting in the legislative chamber, which is one of the less religious states in the country, the religious right was there working hard and lobbying for their point of view. And what I would hear from them, and I, I in many ways admire their hard work, but when they came to the committee, and my judiciary committee had jurisdiction over women's reproductive choices, it had jurisdiction over equality for gay people, it had jurisdiction over a lot of issues involving children, and where I thought the children shouldn't have their human rights uh, suppressed because of religion. And when they came to testify before our committee, they always used a word, and that word was moral. And I knew from the context of what they were saying that when they used that word moral, they meant that my viewpoint about the issue was the immoral viewpoint. And I kept scratching my head and thinking to myself, you know, I think my viewpoint's kind of moral. But yet somehow, they seem to have a trademark on the word moral. In fact, people who advocated for my side on that issue often were somehow uncomfortable or afraid to use the word moral. Well, you know, I think that the word moral has something that's more important and more exalted about it than your naughty bits. You know, that's, they've stolen the word moral and used it for something that's really trivial. And I think it's time for us to take the word moral back. You know, in my parents' time, there were two giants that walked the earth. One giant was five foot six, and his name was Martin Luther King. And another giant was five foot nine, and his name was Robert Kennedy. No two people ever in American history had more death threats, known FBI reported death threats to them for years on end outside of presidents with Secret Service protection. Neither of them had any kind of Secret Service protection they went out day after day after day, and we know what ultimately happened to them, but with great bravery, they spoke about morality. And when they talked about morality, they were talking about the people who were left out. They would want to speak for the Hindu child who gets sent to the other side of the room. They would want to speak for the child in a government school that's losing its funding while religious schools are getting more funding. They would want to speak for what is real morality, that is for including all citizens in an equal and just world. That's what I think we can be in this room. We in this room can be the leaders of the next great international civil rights movement. And I believe from my experience here in Australia with the kind of fun and wit and I don't know, sense of irony that people from Australia have that you are beautifully qualified to be leaders of this international civil rights movement. And so when you talk about having a reclamation of a secular Australia, I think together with the Richard Dawkins Foundation, we can talk about a secular world. So think of it as a modest plan to take over the entire world. Let's do that together, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.
Okay, Sean's very, very keen to get into dialogue with people here. Uh, we've set up a mic over against the wall there, so to make sure everybody hears your question, if anybody does want to, to ask a question, if you could make your way down to the microphone there, you may have to push past the other people in your row. Uh, but uh, please, please think of uh, some questions uh, or some comments uh, to, to ask him, and don't be shy about coming forward. Just while you're uh, um, getting your thoughts together, I thought I'd mention the next meeting of the Central Victorian Atheists and Free Thinkers, which is very pertinent to what um, uh, Sean's just been talking about, because our speaker uh, next month, which will be on the 17th of April, the third Wednesday in April, it'll be uh, 6.30 for 7.30 upstairs at the Albion Hotel, which is just in the next block up to the right there, or your left. Um, and uh, the speaker will be Professor Brian Ellis, who's Emeritus Professor from La Trobe University and a prof professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. He's written a new book just last year called Social Humanism. And in that book, what he tries to do is link um, social, uh, to link morality, moral theory, um, theories of morality with political theories. So he says that uh, if a political theory is going to be valid, it must have a valid moral theory behind it. And what he argues is that uh, neither communism nor capitalism actually have defensible moral theories behind them. He's, and he argues that the only uh, political theory, the only political philosophy that does have a defensible moral theory behind it, justifying it, is uh, social humanism or the welfare state, which he, she, he sees as the underlying um, uh, philosophy behind the welfare state. So that's very relevant to what uh, Sean was just talking about, about the importance of bringing uh, moral theory. And that's on the 17th of April, just up the road. So I'll invite Sean back now to answer questions. Please come up and ask him as many difficult questions as you can. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. I thought that I'd uh, kick off on the Doig president of the Rationalist Society. I took over when Ian decided to retire after Lovely Clinton. Um, and I thought I'd just kick off the questioning with a question to you, Sean, which we have to deal with as well in Australia in the Rationalists. And that is that often um, we are misrepresented as being anti-religion. And I like to say we're not anti-religion, we're pro-secular. So I'm sure you get the same sort of thing, but do you want to just talk about the difference between those two things? Yeah, I uh, just got that uh, pressed upon me today by a uh, reporter uh, from New Zealand. Uh, and I think they were just playing devil's advocate, but they were pushing this viewpoint. Well, aren't you out to just knock down religion? Um, this is the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, uh, where I work, and, and I'm really proud to work uh, there because uh, the values that Richard Dawkins has espoused, and I've heard him say this uh, many times, are really ones, as he states, that are uh, of a tradition a format of reasoning akin to the Enlightenment tradition that really sprang up in the 16 and 1700s. And a byproduct of that tradition, in his view and mine, is that one happens to lack religion. But the, the beauty and the glory of what we offer, and I really think it is a wonderful thing, is that in 200,000, now they're saying maybe 300,000 years of, of human history, We've just had this 400 years or so where you've really seen the sparking of the Enlightenment and we've had tremendous positive progress. Human lifespan essentially doubled in that time. Tremendous growth of our, a lot of problems, but tremendous growth in terms of wealth and socioeconomic status and the vast majority of it directly attributable to the concepts of reason and science. So it's a very positive and very optimistic view Having said that, I will add that there's nothing wrong, and I think there's something good, 
about saying to someone who's religious, well, here's my viewpoint, and I'm happy to persuade you of it. And I get frustrated and will uh, push back when people say to me, oh, you, how dare you proselytize? Well, I would defend the right of uh, a Lutheran minister to go anywhere that they want and to say, here's why Lutheranism is the religion you should choose, or a Hindu, to say, here's why you should choose to be a Hindu. And I have absolutely no qualms, and I'm very proud to go up to someone and say, here's why this is a good worldview that includes a lack of belief in God. It's not out of anger or hostility to religious people, but it's simply stating our values uh, that, again, are really a byproduct of a broader and very optimistic and positive uh, view of the world. Uh, short uh, comment and question. Uh, sold that for from Mr. Short. Um, or, or didn't hold the world record for the pine. That's for pussies. Yeah. He, held, <laughs> he held the world record for drinking a yard glass. <laughs> which is a yard. And it's got a big bowl at the bottom so that all rushes down at the last minute. And I believe he won that when he was the, at Austin University as a race Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yard, yard glass. I think you should have a round of applause for Hawk. A, a footy game where he was at some game walking up the steps, and this is as he's recently. And some young guys put a drink in his hand, and he looks at him, smiles, and goes, bam, knocks that thing down in the second. <laughs> yeah, but when he was prime minister, he didn't drink. Is that right? Yeah, he had a bell car while he was elected, and then he took it out Oh, that's interesting. Uh, my question is um, my recent understanding of American history is from the film Lincoln. Uh, and in that film, <laughs> The Republicans were behaving like Democrats, and the Democrats were behaving like Republicans. Can you explain what's happened in, since then? Well, Meredith and I were just talking about this in the drive over here. Uh, um, that's a big uh, question. Maybe I'll start by saying I was with uh, Richard Dawkins and our executive director, Dr. Cornwell, in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, a couple weeks ago, and um, I quoted a minister. And this minister spoke eloquently. He was a prominent minister in uh, the mid-1800s. And he got up in Charleston, South Carolina, and preached that slavery was ordained uh, by God and expressly uh, approved by the Bible. And he cites scripture, and he proclaims it as a moral good, and does so rather uh, eloquently. Uh, this was a sincere and strongly held belief uh, in the American South. And if you read that continuing education uh, book that some of your Australian schools are using, you'd be surprised things, how little things have, have changed within some of those churches. Uh, so when you talk about Republicans acting like Democrats and Democrats acting like Republicans, uh, there was really at that time Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson spoke for a populist view, but it was a given until the 1830s or so uh, that there was not going to be change in terms of the issue of slavery uh, from any political party, uh, Federalist or, or, you know, at that time, Federalist or the Democrats, or what they called the Democratic Republicans at that time. When Lincoln's party arose, they only nominated someone first in 1856, four years before 1860. Uh, and, and the issue of slavery became a real one, and the abolition of slavery became a real issue, the Republican Party did act, I would argue, more like the kind of small L liberal viewpoint that you hear from Democrats in the United States today. But that was short-lived, uh, and by the time you got to the 1880s or so, the Republican Party had become the party of the mercantile, the corporate <laughs> North. And uh, then you had immigrants, Italians, Irish, Jews, and others who aligned themselves in the North with the Democratic Party and the working class tradition. I don't know how much that has to do with secularism, except this one. I will add a point, especially with German immigrants in the, in the United States, there was a huge and significant movement of free thinkers. They had big associations among German Americans, and it was actually reasonably well accepted uh, in the United States. And in some ways it's sad because uh, they were in some ways more welcomed in America in the uh, late 1800s uh, than, they are, uh, than they are today. Yep. I think for many people the attraction of church is the social belonging, the sense of being welcomed, that warmth, 
more than an unnecessary religious belief. I don't think it's something that rationalists have addressed thoroughly yet, or I haven't heard enough about it. Yeah. Well, I uh, meet with groups that say, and I support their efforts, that say, let's get a building like a church, and let's hold events like a, a church. And, and I think that's a good thing, and I think the sense of community is a good thing. And the other night when I was speaking, someone was saying, let's have our, our choir, and I think that's a wonderful thing too. Uh, so those are all positive, and I understand and respect the sense of community that's uh, valuable there. And certainly with the Humanist Association, for example, they have celebrants who will engage in ceremonies for marriages and for coming of age ceremonies and for when people die, which I think are, are noble and worthy and, and it's good traditions to have. But I still assert that the biggest positive sense of community that we can have, and the one I'm most uh, proud of in this effort and in this movement, is to do something to make the world a better place, to be organizers for justice. And I'm not saying there's any direct parallels, but because of whatever my interests were when I was young, uh, I was very much involved socially uh, in the Democratic Party. And that really, for me, believe it or not, was a sincere hope and belief that you were going to make the world a better place. And when I was volunteering for those campaigns before I was a candidate myself, it was fun, it was exciting, you were meeting people that shared your values, you worked together and people socialized together and dated and did all that good life stuff uh, together. And to me, that's what we most ought to be doing, is find that sense of community through the deepest possible satisfaction you can have in this world, in my view, which is to say, I did something that helped make the world better for somebody else. And I really feel that our viewpoint, which in my view is best uh, encapsulated by the word the enlightenment, our enlightenment viewpoint is the best thing that the human species ever did and we should celebrate and be proud because we're the ones that are making this world a better place. Thank you for coming to Kant and Sean. Uh, and I've discovered tonight for the first time it's Pig Town, so I've been enlightened in many respects. I was interested to hear you to say <laughs> I was interested to hear Ian say that America is the most religious country on the earth or in the world. <laughs> Why not? Oh, why not? Oh, why not? And I would like to say that we are all evolving. All of us are here because we're obviously interested to hear what you have to say. I, for one, would like to hear other people's opinions. But it concerns me greatly when you're talking about generating a, um, an atheistic governance throughout the world. Because I believe that without us looking at the whole package of there being a creative spirit, a, a, a spirit energy that we're all connected to, and the fact that we are spirit beings, and without some sort of order at a spiritual level, there's invariably anarchy. Um, most, of us would, what? Anarchy. Anarchy. most of us would agree that religion has caused the great majority of the problems we've seen the world over. And so my question to you is, do you see that it's actually God who's creating the problem or people who are creating the problem? and false religions that have risen up to create these problems. And Catholicism has been mentioned a number of times tonight, and anyone who's, who knows history knows that Catholicism sabotaged the teachings of Jesus in 380 AD, when Jesus' teachings were based on love and reconciliation and unity and peace and justice and equality. So my question is, isn't it time we all start thinking about the true role that God has in society and to look at how that can bring about the peace on earth if, if we are seriously wanting to generate peace and if we're seriously wanting to find ways through youth suicide, depression, all of these issues that are spirit-based. Um, okay, I may need to ask some 
clarifications are up. We can ask clarifications when we go to the pub. Sorry. But uh, no, no, I'll, I'll answer. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer. I meant, uh, yeah, we can talk further there because I'm not sure I got everything. But let me, let me put it this way. First, I don't advocate uh, any atheist government. That's not what I would advocate. I'd advocate for secular government, and I would defend anyone, including the most extreme religious person, nonviolently, to espouse whatever they want to espouse. You know, uh, if they want to believe in the Koran or even Scientology, anything that you want to believe, I would defend your right to believe it to the point that you start to remove the rights of others. Uh, so I, I don't believe in any atheist government. I believe in a secular government, and we can work toward that. Now, I, I didn't quite get because that was the part where I wasn't quite sure about it, because you said something, is it of people or of God? Well, I don't believe in the existence of God or devils or anything uh, supernatural. So uh, to me, religion is uh, a construct, if you will, and I think and optimistically believe, and I think based on good evidence, that over time, that construct is, is fading away and that reason and science, to the great benefit of humanity, is, is replacing it. When you use the word spiritual, it's, it's an interesting word. Uh, Carl Sagan used the word spiritual, and I think it can be a very good uh, word. I feel spiritual in the sense that uh, I feel wonder and awe at the beauty of the universe and the experience of love and art and all those things. I guess one can call that spiritual. But there's another definition of spiritual that I happen to reject completely, which is that there's something supernatural going on. I'm happy to believe in something supernatural. If somebody, if somebody shows me evidence today that there's something supernatural going on and it's convincing evidence, I will believe in something supernatural like that. But I've never seen it. So it, that definition of, of spirituality I, I, I reject. But if what you mean, and I'll just sort of expand from there, but if what you mean is that we should care about our fellow human beings and work for their betterment, then that I think we're on the same page, is that we work for a, a loving and a caring and secular world, but I would argue that the pathway to that is the pathway of reason and science. Yeah. And so um, all of my own I really feel strongly that you may have raised one of the greatest human rights violations that exists in the world today. Really taking children, and I'm just going to give you a, a taste of some of the examples. I actually have given whole speeches on, on just that one topic. Uh, in the United States, just a few examples. Uh, there's uh, so-called faith healing laws. Isn't that a malicious misnomer, faith healing? Because it's an absolute lie. People get harmed and, and seriously injured. But there's 38 states in which they give greater leeway to parents to medically neglect their child under the law uh, because they're in a so-called faith healing home. And I know someone directly, I'm going to be speaking with her in June in San Diego, who is in a faith healing home. And when she described her story to me, that she had an infected leg, her favorite hobby, this, she was 14, 15 years old, her hobby was to ride horses. She loved it, that was her passion in life, uh, not because of riding, but somehow or another she got a injury in her leg and an infection, and her parents, instead of taking her to a doctor, put a cookie tray underneath her leg so the pus would drain out onto the cookie tray. Eventually, her leg bone fused into kind of a bent position, and ultimately, it was deemed more functional for her to have her leg amputated. Uh, and think about this, this girl going through what is like some kind of medieval torture uh, that's one. Child cares. This is only in about 13 states, but it shouldn't be in any states, where they say religious child cares don't have to obey the same laws in America as secular child cares. We're talking about health and safety laws. We're talking about medication safety regulations, child staff ratios, basic safety for our most vulnerable people on earth. And they say, well, we'll just ignore that if you happen to say you're religious. And there's been extreme cases where children have been placed in situations of danger, filthy diapers left for hours. I'm not saying religious people are bad, but when there's no oversight, 
bad things happen more frequently. And in a, one extreme case, uh, there was a child who, who died left alone in a van uh, in the sun in Alabama because they didn't have proper training for the staff or proper child staff ratios. All because somebody goes to the legislature of a state and says, we're religious, and they look nice and polite, and they clean up nice, and they say, you know, we'd like to have this exemption, and the politicians go, oh, it has to do with religion. Well, then, let's hurry up and pass a law to uh, pander to you. How horrific. How utterly horrible. And I think it gets even worse. With Title IX, which is the clause in our law in America that says no religious, uh, excuse me, no gender bias. They said, you know, you can't treat girls as inferior uh, in school or give them unequal treatment in school. This is back 40 years ago. They have an express exemption in the law that says, oh, except if it's one of the religious tenets of your school, then you can. In, in, two, in 2013, then you can say, and there's hundreds of thousands of people in these schools in America. So think about being the girl in the school in 2013. You're taught. You're taught that you could be, uh, should be, subordinate. And I think it's even uh, as bad for the boys, that they're taught that somehow girls are supposed to be subordinate to them. How's that going to affect the thinking pattern of the boys or girls for the rest of their lives? It's outrageous. James Dobson, I'm getting on a high horse here, but James Dobson, the leader of Focus on the Family, this guy uh, who's not a minor figure, they have over a hundred million dollar budget, this organization, just one of many uh, fundamentalist policy organizations in the United States, he said, and I'm quoting, that pain is a marvelous purifier, and you know who he's applying that to? Children. He also said that if a child uh, starts to cry when you're spanking him, give him more of what gave, uh, started him to cry originally, and make sure that they cry, in his words, genuinely. And his organization has huge influence. When you talk about corporal punishment in the United States, they were generally making it illegal to engage in corporal punishment in schools in the United States, but they advocate for private schools to be exempted from corporal punishment, and they've been successful in many states in exempting private schools from corporal punishment. So these are just some, but it boils down to something even more fundamental, which is why you're, what you raise is so important, and Richard Dawkins has talked about this, that for a child, the most important thing, the most important thing I think of all, other than giving them food and shelter and basic nutrition, is that when we are go taking them through the educational process, we don't tell them what to think, we teach them how to think and to have critical thinking skills. And I can tell you, in fundamentalist schools in the United States, and sadly, grow increasingly in Australia, it's the exact opposite, that we're going to label you, we're going to tell you what to think. You know, the world was created in six 24-hour days, and to me, that whole tissue of issues is a violation of the human rights of children, and we're the ones who are most speaking about it, and we should be really proud that we're raising this issue. As uh, Professor Dawkins has said, you know, there's no Marxist seven-year-olds, there's no, you know, liberal Democrat seven-year-olds or Labor Party seven-year-olds, and there aren't Catholic or Muslim or Hindu seven-year-olds, they're just seven-year-olds. Let them grow, let them achieve, let them learn, and they can decide whether they want to join those religions or political parties later in life. Large group 
and they are fairly large, as some say it's the third largest religious group, the non-affiliated. Uh, how do we get them involved in politics to combat the Brahmas and the, you know, the religious uh, yeah. organizations? Well, that is certainly the biggest challenge we face. It's what uh, my book is about and what I want to do with the Richard Dawkins Foundation. For me, the, the biggest uh, technique or strategy that we can use is perhaps to overcome uh, what I think is a, a noble flaw uh, within uh, the secular viewpoint, and humanist, atheist, whatever term you want to use. And that is that we have, I would say, uh, non-evidence-based faith in evidence in terms of persuading other people. Uh, by that I mean uh, that I will see a lot of secularists say, here's a stack of statistics, uh, now you must agree with me. Or, uh, here's the ten uh, statements from the Bible that show you're an idiot. Um, I don't think either of those two techniques are necessarily persuasive. What I think is based on evidence uh, persuasive is certainly to have an evidence-based viewpoint, certainly to have uh, evidence to back up what you're saying, but that something we've not done very well is appeal to people through stories and emotion. I'm not saying that that's the whole technique, but the stories and the emotion are the opening of the door. And if you can't get them to open the door, you're not going to get to the next stage of the process with them. And a big part of that is the kind of approach of what type of issues that we raise. And I think there's a, a bit of an, uh, too much of a tendency, certainly in America, with the secular movement, to go after symbolic issues. I'm the first guy, I don't know if you guys don't have it on your coins, but in America it has in God we trust and all this sort of thing. I'm against that. It shouldn't be there on our coins. In San Diego, they shouldn't have that cross on public land on the hill that they have. And there's good reason they shouldn't, by the way. Gary Peck, uh, Gregory Peck was from San Diego. And when he was a young man, he knew about the predecessor of that cross, and it was associated with the Ku Klux Klan in California, and Gregory Peck strongly objected to it. So I appreciate and value that we should address those symbolic issues. But I'll be blunt that I don't think they work in terms of persuading what in America we call Joe Sixpack, or what do we call it here, Bogan? Uh, is that <laughs> the, Those folks, we want to persuade them. And I think they're persuadable. I mean, I really think that if you say to Joe Sixpack, you know, look at what happened to this girl with the leg, and isn't that awful? I think he's going to be a good guy most of the time and say, yeah, I'm with you. So I think we can get there. Uh, and so persuade with stories. And another part uh, of your issue is I wrote a chapter in my book about this, is these polls. In most countries, uh, there has not been the type of poll that will get to us in a proper way. Certainly in the American polling, it's been done wrong. What they'll say is, are you an atheist, for example? Well, it, especially in America with the saturation that we had in mid-20th century of godless communism and Stalin and all those things that have you know, come down through the generations of hostility to the Soviet Union and the communist Chinese, that just most people are not going to answer yes to that question. I think it should be framed more accurately in a different way. If you had a series of polling questions that allows people, it's kind of like getting into a hot bath, you know, you kind of ease your way in there. And uh, an example is Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt in the 50s did a uh, This I Believe. They probably don't have this in Australia, but it's where usually famous people, but sometimes not, give their values in a, like a five-minute little essay. And she talked in this essay, this is after President Roosevelt was dead, about how she and Franklin uh, would, whether or not they would send their children to church. And the implicit statement in this is that neither one of them particularly believed in it. She didn't say she was atheist or agnostic or anything like that, but basically what she came down with was that Franklin kind of said, well, it's good to expose them to the culture of it or something like that. But they weren't arguing belief. And I think there are so many Americans like that. If you said in a gentle way, well, are you certain that there's an afterlife? Are you certain uh, that there's such a thing as hell? 
that I would argue that the majority of people really don't buy into that and live their lives as secular people in day-to-day -day life. And I think that is how we should approach our polling data because I think it shows which people really live their lives with the belief that there's some hell up there, and there's a lot of them, but then I think there's a lot more who say, no, they don't really buy that day to day, and I think that's us, I think that's our community. So, I think that's an answer to your question. Yes, practical uh, question following on from the previous one. Uh, I totally commend the development of the 10-point plan. Yeah. But you described early on how the <clears throat> fundamentalist right in the U.S. shifted the national government and everyone else by working up through the school councils, the town councils, lobbying the legislatures, and so on to actually get their agenda into law. Yes. Now obviously here we're gonna have to do the same sort of thing. Yes. We're gonna get these 10 points. Yeah. So, so the problem is Australians tend to be rather laid back. Uh, most of us here... Your Australian accent's distinct. <laughs> <laughs> and Claire Dinkin-Mosians are about 50% of the other Australians. <laughs> I wouldn't go back to the States to yeah. live for anything. <laughs> they, don't like, they don't like your government. <laughs> and I particularly don't like what the fundamentalists have done to it. Yeah. So, my question is, how do we apply what they have done all too well here in Australia, given one, that we're generally laid back, and two, I would say most of us who had enough time to really think these issues through no longer have kids in school. Uh, and that's why we actually have gotten to the point to think about things like this. The religious right, on the other hand, and push the God-fearing uh, family types into these uh, positions and lobbying roles. How do we do it here? Well, like I say, <laughs> yeah. here, I, I've heard that argument, uh, and I, under, I appreciate it, yeah. you know, uh, but I, I will say it does echo arguments I'll also hear elsewhere. For instance, if I travel to Washington State, which I heard was the most secular. So I don't know which one it is, but it's one of those. It's either in the Northwest or in Northern uh, New England that would be the most secular states of the Union. And I will, I will go to events like this and people will stand up and say, hey, we here in Washington State, we've got it good. And we're pretty laid back in Washington State and you know this isn't gonna happen. Uh, or that's the implication, that we're not gonna be able to get it done. Or I'll go to Alabama, which I've done, and people will say in Alabama, are you kidding me? Look at our politicians. They're madmen and they win all the elections. What are we going to do if we have a secular viewpoint? And so there's challenges like that on either side. What I think you can only answer for success is work, organizing. I want to see, and the Richard Dawkins Foundation will help with this, if you guys work on a really significant and successful state or national conventions that focus on issues, focus on policy. Australia did a fantastic job and had this huge international convention that I commend you for, it was great. But it was sort of focused internationally, which again is very valuable. But I think focusing on Australia and Australian issues would also be very valuable. Developing the local speakers. I think there's too much of a dependency, not just here in Australia, everywhere, where they say, let's have a convention, let's get Richard Dawkins. And, and it sort of becomes the magic solution for how we're going to hold a convention. I think we need to start developing that team locally, wherever we are. And I'm going to be doing this in every state of the union, and I'm eager to do grassroots trainings and work with people here to get that done. I also think part of my answer was the 
answer I gave earlier, to have those compelling human stories. I think you have here some serious stories in Australia with these issues involving your schools that can pull at people's heartstrings, and we should go ahead and do that. And then another thing is I think people like to be noble. I think they find it exciting and good. They want to hear that we're going to try to help some guy in Pakistan. They want to be asked to do the right thing. And I think if we convey that to people and that we're the movement conveying that rather than being the movement of no, which I think sometimes we're perceived as, then I think we can start to bring uh, people together successfully. So there's a lot of threads to it, but I, I think it is entirely doable. And I really reject the premise and, and no, I'm not saying from you, for just in general, and I understand it, but it's kind of a defeatist premise where people say, oh, you know, because of it's good, we can't do it, or because it's bad, we can't do it. But again, I go back to the religious right. If they can organize successfully for intolerance and injustice, we should be able to organize for justice and reason and compassion, and I think we will. And, <laughs> and we'll socialize at the pub because... Yeah, Ready to switch from water here. This yeah. is, you know. Uh, welcome to Kind of Sure. Yeah. I've got a question that harks back to something that you just said before. I did a little bit of research on American history this afternoon. Yes. In about 15 seconds on the internet. <laughs> I discovered that America was a secular state until 1956. Yeah. Let me explain this. Um, symbolism is important in the, in the life of nations. And, and apart from the, the bad examples set on the coins, um, up until 1956, the most important symbol of the American state, and the president stands in front of it, or, or behind it rather, every time he gives a press conference, is the great seal of the United States. Up until 1956, it had a Latin inscription on it that was entirely secular in nature. And I won't try to pronounce the Latin, but I think that... Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can, can you translate that for us? Uh, from many one. From many, and that refers to the union, presumably, of the yeah. states into a single nation. Yeah. Um, in God we trust. It, having it on there on the Great Seal, it's like it's like writing it into the Constitution. Yeah. So, so I've got two questions. One, what happened in 1956? Was it communism that that gave rise to this? That the Red Scare era, you got the coin change, you got the seal change. The big one, actually, I think even bigger than that, uh, again, affecting children in the United States, was the pledge. My father uh, did the pledge, of course, every day in school, mm -hmm. and he didn't say uh, in one nation under God. That was added in 1954 and from 54 forward in America. It's always been under God. I've always refused to say that. <laughs> but uh, to me, that is really an example, and it's good you raised this, because what was that about? That was about, and I don't know how many Australians know or care about this point in American history, but it was a scary and ugly, ugly uh, time in American history. It was the Joseph McCarthy era, and he would go up and he started in Wheeling, West Virginia, and waved his alleged list of communists. He was a complete fraud and a liar and a cheat. But yet he said, there's these communists, and he ruined people's lives and destroyed other human beings, and he was always going on about godless communism, and the person who was most assiduously, uh, and, but more craftily, uh, articulating these as well was a fellow named Richard Nixon. And it was a dirty, mean era in American history. And I always look, whenever somebody uh, is waving God around, and I really, I don't mean this even as for or against religion, I just mean it as a political observation. But when some politician starts waving God around, hold on to your wallet and look out for what's going on. Well, <laughs> the, the, uh, the great symbol of Australia, the Australian coat of arms that uh, Parliament has, it doesn't have a motto. It had a motto once, we just have a kangaroo and an emu. Uh, but I, I have a feeling that, that, that there's an aspirant to the Prime Ministership in Australia that would like, in God we trust, to be written underneath that, that chair. But anyway, the second part of my question is, given the fact that 
in God we trust is entrenched so deeply in American symbolism and just, just like the right to bear arms has been written into the Constitution and is misused. Uh, will a 10-point plan cut it in this age of unenlightenment, internet blogs, when the most ignorant opinions get the same weight as the most uh, carefully thought about and studied opinions? And, and how, how do you cut through uh, all the stupidity in the information age to, to get a positive message across about a secular state? Because it's not a sexy idea. It's, it's something that you have to think about. Well, that's why I think we start with people. Every part of the 10-point vision of a secular America, and I, and I think the Australian uh, version is uh, based on a similar concept, but I know for sure with the 10-point vision of a secular America that there is a story, there are, there's, I write about a story about victims in every single case. Uh, and they represent many, many other people in every single case in 10 areas of American law. So that we are not, uh, as much as I understand the issue of symbolism, going there with the 10-point vision of a secular America. We're saying we're the people who are for other people. We don't say that there's some 2,000-year-old document that authorizes us to be mean. That's always what I've thought it comes right down to. I've got a 2,000-year-old piece of paper. I say it's magic. I get to be mean to you. Right? We take a different view of that, and I think if we're talking about justice and fairness and kindness, and then we talk about the people who are the victims of injustice and unfairness and unkindness, then we're the ones who look like the good guys and are marketing ourselves better than I think we have uh, in the past. Is it going to be easy? Is it going to be a slam dunk? No, but I don't think it was a slam dunk for the religious right, and they made a lot of, of progress. And I think history is on our side. I, I feel great optimism, and a lot of it has to do with these polling issues. I mean, you look at the young people, whether it's in Australia or the young people in America, they are headed in our direction. What we need to do is organize. And, uh, uh, we're coming towards the end, so if people could make their questions fairly brief for now. Sure, and thanks very much for being here, and uh, thanks for the government, and thanks for the Central uh, Victorian uh, yeah, Atheist yeah. Free Thinkers Group for helping that go. I love being out here. It's good. It's <laughs> sort of different from yeah, the other places. Don't know how it was my name. Um, you were making a point earlier in the preamble about uh, the religious right in uh, Australia. You made some comments about Gough Whittle and uh, in Victoria, the Catholic group, uh, and the Democratic Labour Party, just a historical point, uh, there was a, a very well-known Labour man, Catholic, uh, who was very high in the order of uh, the, uh, the social order of the Catholic Church, uh, Arthur Call. Arthur Call led the immigration program in Australia post the Second World War. He became leader of the Labour Party, and he had a very significant role with the roots of the Catholic movement within the Australian Labour Party. Gough realised that he took in government when he, he, was, he was deputy leader to Arthur Call. When he became leader, he realised that to win, uh, to become Prime Minister and for Labour to wrest the power from the Liberal Country Party over those 20 years, he had to get a strong base in Victoria. And he worked very hard to go off in Victoria when doing that, and he was helped by a lot of people to do that and to democratise the Australian Labour Party in Victoria branch. He called was a very, very strong political figure in, uh, in Australian political life. I think uh, the, 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 the book, so I'm important on that to get that context. The other thing we mentioned as well, if I may, was that uh, about the, uh, the role of the religious right. You can be assured that in Australia there's a very strong movement against the Australian Christian lobby. Very important to realise in the dynamics of Australian religious culture that they've uh, been helped indeed by a wonderful progressive liberal theologian in America, John Shady Spong, in creating a new dynamic in Australian, the real Australian religious life of having a more progressive religious culture which unravels unravels completely the stories of uh, the fundamentalists. I would think that when you were talking about earlier too, there was a point about um, resource allocation. 
And with the Bureau of Civil Resources Allocation, it's very, very important to understand with that religious, uh, with religious right, what's your point of movement? There has been a movement uh, in which a lot of people who are liberal, who are trying to bring about a change in the resource allocation. I uh, just want to take account of what is happening in terms of what has been happening in Australian uh, political life with the movement from uh, the religious right and the fight against the religious right within the dynamics of those who are pluralists in our society. Yeah. Well, if I understand your statement, if you're saying uh, it's good to have allegiances with uh, liberal religionists who support separation of church and state, I entirely agree. We need to have, uh, if there are folks, Catholic, Anglican, any other denomination that say we want to have separation of church and state, we want to work with them. I will note that a lot of times they say they don't want to work with us, and that's pure uh, prejudice, and we need to stand up against that. Okay. And where are we inviting people for social time? The Albion. The Albion? Okay. Is that, that's close to here, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Mine's a pretty broad question. Now, Chris Mitchell said that he wouldn't want to see a church down here because we don't know what to left to argue with. Um, I'm just wondering how you would like to see the world in 100 years. How would you like to see the world in 100 years? See, oh, how would I like to see it? Well, I'd like to see our, our cause completely succeed. I really am optimistic that eventually, given the scale of time and how successful the Enlightenment has been in 400 years, that uh, we will make tremendous progress in the next 100 years. I wish I could live to see a hundred years from now. But the answer is I have no idea. What I do think, if I were to make a prediction, is that in the coming hundreds of years there will be a significant fading of religion and uh, assuming we don't make huge mistakes, blow ourselves up with bombs mm -hmm. or ruin the environment so we all die or get hit by a meteor that we don't prepare for, <laughs> that uh, I think that, you know, barring those unfortunate events, that things look pretty good. Despite all the terrible, horrible things, I feel really optimistic about the future. A book uh, I'd recommend is The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, where despite our perceptions about how everything's horrible, horrible, and bad, and there are a lot of horrible, horrible, bad things in the world, reason, civil society, the, the urge to start to think clearly. We got a long way to go, but there has been some success with that. I'd rather live in Australia than live anywhere in the Middle Ages mm -hmm. for all its problems. There has been significant progress for this species and it's up to us to be the ones to take it to the next step and I do believe that the viewpoint of reason and science over the view of the fundamentalist and the doctrinaire is the better viewpoint and we're the ones who are gonna make the world a better place. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask, can I just ask um, if you have any advice for a uh, film school graduate who wants to dedicate his life to this on how to get onto the bandwagon? I'm sorry. I just said, would you have any advice for a, uh, a film school graduate who wants to dedicate his life to this? Film school. Yeah. Film school. Oh, yeah. Like, how do I end on the bandwagon? You know, I, I, some of these things that we've talked about here in Australia show the human story of those problems. I mean, we're working on this documentary where we're gonna show the victims that I talk about these issues in America, and we're gonna do the lifestyles of the rich and religious and put it on film. Google map those, those mega mansions and we'll show you what we're talking about, but show the injustice. And that, some of that's true in Australia too. You are seeing the growth of some of these you know, big time mega ministers here in Australia. I say expose them. To me, there's nothing, it just makes my skin crawl. It does. Yeah. Looking at these guys who are running around saying, you know, sorry, obey women, and you gay people are bad, and by the way, I'm going to take my, you know, limo over to my mansion. Well, the hell with you. You know, I can't stand those people. Let's expose them. Okay. Have you, have you got a very short question? Very, oh, just very short. It was just a, very, a co quick comment. It's really easy for us to sit here and say, Sean's from America, and this is all happening from America. Well, I'm a mum here in central Victoria, and my daughter came home from school, she's a, a high school, in tears because her mate um, wasn't allowed to give her a hug. Um, they've been hugging since prep, nothing sexual, but all of a sudden caught up in the, the youth group, which recruited children through the breakfast program at school, 
Now he has a contract set up by this particular church group where he's not allowed to hug girls, he's no longer allowed to go and stay at their house, and what they're doing also is on the 2nd of April, they're going to take busloads of our children from all throughout central Victoria to Planet Shakers. And what do they see there? They see faith healing. I actually allowed my daughter to go last year, and I felt a terrible mum, because they're lined up are all these people with disability and the message is that they're evil and they're praying over them, they're doing all this sort of stuff. My daughter said to me, Mum, they were frightened but these faith healers were yelling at them and touching them and instead of their carer removing them because they were uncomfortable, they moved them further into it. So it's easy for us to think this is in America but this is central Victoria. I'd just like to remind you. Okay, thank you. And, um, Any, anybody who's here from uh, up in Bendigo, where, sorry, I've forgotten your name? Kate. Kate comes from. Um, uh, they're trying to start a, a similar movement to, to ours up in Bendigo. I know some of our people come down from Bendigo, so keep your eyes out for that because uh, things are happening up in Bendigo. Um, one quick little last thing about the next meeting. I forgot to mention at the next meeting we're going to be raffling. This is in, we have to get people to come along. So we're going to hold a raffle and the prize is going to be a copy of Richard Dawkins' new book uh, and it's going to be a signed copy, signed by Richard Dawkins. So if you come along to the next meeting on the uh, 17th at the, uh, at the Albion, um, you'll be able to be in line to get a copy of that prize. Now, um, we're going to uh, uh, decamp those who want to down to the Albion for a drink, and, and I think Sean hasn't eaten yet, so we, we need to feed him. We hope Marissa's still got the kitchens going. And uh, um, so those who want to join Sean and Meredith, uh, can, the, 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 it's the hotel, just, um, just turn right here, cross the first street, and it's on the next corner. Um, for those who feel like a bit of exercise before they drink, we do have to put all the chairs in stacks against the walls before we go, so it'd be nice if two or three people at least could stay and help us do that. The rest of you, go and have a drink with Sean, and in the meanwhile, let's thank him for a really wonderful presentation.